This broadcast of OPF Radio on February 18th of 2013 is about the social contract. Gary Hunt is the guest, and your host is Sleepy Salsa. And that was Ashley Alicize's A Dangerous Situation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Outpost of Freedom Radio. Many people have their own peculiar notions of what constitutes a social contract. Some think that it is a mutually beneficial contract with government, yet others consider it to be an excuse for coercive manipulation by the state. Are either of these true, or is there another explanation altogether? More importantly, does any notion of the social contract really matter in terms of securing our liberties? With that said, let us turn to our guest. Gary, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good evening, Sleepy. Good evening, sir. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Gary, what is the social contract? Well... As the name implies, it's social or societal, developed from society, and it's a contract. Now, a contract has two important elements. One is a meeting of the minds, and the other one is a consideration for a consideration. Uh, So we need to keep that in mind. The meeting of the minds is the one that might develop the most uh, question as we continue the discussion. But let's look at it. Uh, Everybody has been involved in a social contract if they're breathing or if they breathed at any point in time. They were born into a family, and there's a social contract there. Uh, The consideration for consideration, you could say very basically, is, look, kid, we'll feed you, but you better do what you're told. Uh, And that's the consideration for consideration. Uh, It might be a, a... paternal society, it might be a maternal society, but at any rate, it is a social contract within that uh, that society, the family. So, social contract, by its very definition, can be broadly interpreted. Now, we can get specific, and we will as we continue, uh, as to what different social contracts, especially the one of primary concern is, which would be, say, the Constitution and whether there is meeting of the minds and consideration for consideration. But uh, understanding the, the concept of uh, social contract, uh, that is it, and it's, it's very broad, and we will bring it down to specific as we continue. Um, there's a question of who creates the social contract. Uh, uh, we should have a link posted up there shortly. This is uh, an article I wrote that deals with the initial society, the uh, tribal societies of of times past, Neanderthal. It it seems that evidence suggests that tribal societies existed throughout. Now, occasionally, uh, archaeological evidence demonstrates maybe just a single family in one area, Now, a tribe might be that family in in subsequent generations as they grow, but at any rate, there's always a social contract, whether written or not, that's understood. And, you know, in caveman days, it might have been, uh, you'll participate or I'm going to hit you over the head with this club, you'll have sex with me or I'm going to drag you into the cave by your hair. Whatever it is, there's the reciprocity. Uh, The American Indians, the women did the bulk of the work, the men hunted and fought. That's about all they did, and and socialized. And the women did the work. So we've got a situation where there is a trade-off, that one does one thing and one does the other. Uh, That's a social contract. Well, who creates the social contract? Well, uh, 
probably the easiest way to describe that in, say, a tribal context would be acquiescence, because we know from the study of slavery that quite often uh, one of the members of the tribe that fell in disrespect might be sold to the slavers and eventually end up coming over here, free ride. Uh, it could be personality or it could be somebody's not doing their job. But the social contract is is made by a common agreement in most cases, sometimes in writing. The larger the society, the greater the likelihood there will be some degree of writing uh, establishing the social contract. A good example is the uh, the British Const- English Constitution. It was written, but it was written in many different pieces of paper over many years. Uh, finally, they consolidated at least a Bill of Rights, uh, but it's created by the strength of the society and by acquiescence to a, a form of leadership, whether it be a, uh, an, an individual or a group of people. Uh, American Indians, again, they had chiefs. Uh, we're under the, from cowboy movies, under the perception that uh, there's only one chief to a tribe, but in my work with the Indians uh, back in the 90s, uh, two, two reservations, the Golden Hill Pagesic and the uh, Onondaga in Albany, New York, uh, it was clear that there's more than one chief in a tribe, and the chiefs, are, surprisingly, are selected by the clan mothers. The women pick the chiefs. That way, if a chief does wrong, the clan mother uh, remove him from chief. Chief, you know, if they get their sons killed, they remove them from chiefhood. So the structure of uh, who creates it uh, is acquiescence or common agreement. However, the structure that gives leadership or or form to it. Uh, or authority to it uh, varies from the tribal, from the, the paternal and maternal family, uh, uh, societal like a, an Indian tribe, uh, a monarchy uh, by force uh, imposes his will. And, and uh, heredity determines these, uh, the subsequent leader. So uh, speaking on that note, though, would it be accurate to say that the social contract is a myth perpetuated by government? No. <laughs> How can it be mythical when it exists in every form of society, from the family to uh, even the United Nations, in effect, in effect, is a social contract, but it's a contract between nations. If you go to work for somebody, whether you've got an employment contract there's a social contract involved in that it, it, that discusses things such as behavior. Uh, regardless of, of how you look at it, there's, uh, social contracts exist in one form or another, mild, weak, uh, uh, not very defined ones to very rigidly defined ones. And again, acquiescence uh, or submission to force is the catalyst that generally tends to hold them together. No, there's a, a another link for the link man that uh, is Elements of Civil Government, published in 1891. It was written by a, guy, a professor named Peters, and it will demonstrate uh, the same thing we're talking about, the, the social contracts that exist from the family level to the national level in the United States as perceived by people 122 years ago. Uh, this, so we can look back 122 years and say, these are the various forms of societal or social contracts that existed in this country. And you could also call, call them governments. Uh, it's almost interchangeable. Uh, government being the structure, the social contract being the overall, including the both sides. But that uh, elements of civil, civil government will... Uh, explained from family to church to school board as they were then, uh, to city or town to county to state and to the national government. And each one of those is a social contract. And you're a member of each one of those that you participate in. If you don't participate in the school board or the church, obviously you're not, not a part of them because they're, uh, say, a bit more abstract. They're not geographically situated. But the family is geographically situated as long as they're living in the same household. The town is geographically situated. The uh, county is geographically 
situated. The state is geographically situated and the federal government is geographically situated. So there are two types in there. One is a voluntary participation, um, the church, and the other one is uh, the mandatory participation by geographic location. You spoke about participation. You just mentioned about the difference between something that was voluntary and mandatory. So I guess that would beg the question then, is the social contract coercive or voluntary? Well, the contract itself it has got to be voluntary, uh, and that's the acquiescence. Now, is it coercive? It can become coercive. Uh, let's take a good example. Suppose uh, a country has a con written constitution, in fact, the first fully written constitution, and that constitution is a written contract for the social contract, and that constitution creates the government, authorizes its existence, establishes the structure for it and how uh, positions are, are given in it. It provides powers and authorities and limitations, and it also preserves certain rights of the people. Um, that's a, a voluntary uh, participation, acquiescence to the whole. However, when it becomes coercive, when it violates the contract, when it breaches the contract, now we're in, in, a, in a realm that uh, uh, has to be looked at a little bit differently, and that realm is basically uh, a breach of the contract. Now, I wrote another article a while back, uh, Sons of Liberty 14, if we can get the uh, link guy to, to do his uh, uh, Sons of Liberty 14. Um, what happens when there's a breach of contract? Uh, well, you can acquiesce, or you could decide that you're not going to acquiesce. And a good example of not acquiescing uh, would be the United States of America. Uh, initially, there were some rubs uh, going back to the uh, the Stamp Act in 1865. Uh Petitions put out, they felt that their rights were being violated by virtue of the imposition of taxes without their consent. Um, but then, you know, time went on, the acquiescence continued, and uh, it wasn't until uh, the, the T-tax and subsequent events where people started saying, well, maybe we have a breach of contract here. And finally, on July 4th, 1776, uh, a paper was recorded for the world, a document was recorded for the world explaining that there is a breach of contract. It laid out the reasons uh, behind the breach, and even though they didn't have the written constitution to fall back on, just the sc scattered documents over centuries, they felt the contract had been breached. However, in a, the context of what... Uh, uh, John Locke wrote in Second Treatise of Government, uh, Chapter 19, which has to do with dissolution of government, we have uh, really a document that is a dissolution of government. It dissolved the government. It dissolved the bonds between the people of the United States. And face it, it was a small majority, but they were an outspoken majority, and they said, we're going to do this. They dissolved their relationship with the United or the British government, the royal government, and uh, proceeded then to establish a new social contract, this one with a written contract so that there be no misunderstanding on what the limitations on government would be. Well, then... Are human beings inherently evil or weak in their nature? And if so, does the social contract take this into account? Well, obviously, the, in, a, in the first social contract, the family, there are some that are weaker. They're infants. They breastfeed from their mother, and they shit wherever they want to. You know, their life is completely different than it is with... Uh, uh, in a, a larger structure. And in any society, there are always weaker and stronger people. Uh, does the contract take this into the account? 
Well, I would say it depends a lot on the, the contract. The United States uh, Constitution does not make a, a provision uh, to deal with weak, and it's limited provisions with regard to evil. And those limited provisions with regard to evil have to do with uh, affronts to the government itself, treason, uh, counterfeiting, uh, or even violations of understood rights that are necessary, and those go into the uh, protection of the, for the arts and sciences of copyright and patent, the right to uh, retain things. Uh, so very minimally, they address uh, the weaknesses. In most states' constitutions, I think you've got the same thing. There's very little uh, said about weaknesses, though most of those societies, especially on the uh, town, the county, and perhaps the state level, accommodation was made with state hospitals. Um, the original hospitals were considered charitable. They weren't profit centers. Um, education, to educate people, was considered, uh, you know, bringing, I, I wouldn't say they were weak or um uh, anything, but they were uneducated, and so the educational system brought them up to a level, to a par, uh, where they were recognized as, uh, uh, by the social contract, as requiring a degree of uh, favor. Now, as far as the evil... Uh, there are provisions in each from the federal down to the family. The family, there's an old saying, spoil the, uh, there's a, uh, hold the rod and spoil the child or something like that. Uh, the town, the county, incarceration after conviction of a crime of evil, uh, not mala prohibita, but uh, encroachments on other people's rights. Um uh, the federal level, as I mentioned, that counterfeiting and treason and certain crimes, piracy, are addressed specifically to uh, to deal with evil. So there's a balancing factor, one being in the written law, tending to be in the written law or the adopted common law, and the other tending to be one of sympathy and charity where uh, accommodation is made for those that are on the weak side of the spectrum. Does the social contract violate the non-aggression principle? Well, the non-aggression principle, uh, I think first, Sleepy, so that the listening audience has an idea of what a non-aggression principle is, that you need to give us a brief explanation of the non-aggression principle before I can address that. So I'll give you the floor now. Sure. Uh, very briefly, the non-aggression principle is a moral premise that the initiation of force is always immoral. That's what the non-aggression principle, or NAP, fundamentally means. Well, um, I guess to some degree that's pretty easily defined because if somebody is aggressive against me, uh, you know, the problem comes in, in what is aggression? Is it calling somebody a name? Uh, is it slapping somebody in the face or is it shooting somebody? But when we, we talked about the evil, when there's something that has a detrimental or an injurious effect on another person, uh, it has to be dealt with. Now, the non-aggression principle, principles are interesting things. How do you codify a principle? Uh, or is it left to each individual to determine what the encroachment is and the, whether the encroachment is sufficient to be to respond to with aggression, by the way. Uh, so I can't really answer whether it violates the non-aggression principle unless we define that principle in more uh, definitive terms than just being aggressive. Fair enough. So is the natural right of self-defense compatible with the social contract? In our society in the United States and in the state constitutions initially, yes, absolutely. The, uh, the Bill of Rights, for example, the first right is uh, religion, uh, press, and, and uh, uh, speech, and, and uh, the right to petition. The second one is 
first is self-defense. It is the ability to defend yourself. That's in this society, but there have been societies throughout the world where an individual within that social contract has no recourse. Uh, the feudal system in England uh, could be pretty brutal if the uh, the dictator was not benevolent, if the lord was not benevolent. He could uh, do just about anything he wanted. So that varies from the social con- uh, with within the social contract or the uh, the concept of the contra- uh, contract itself, the social contract. But uh, is can there be a social contract? that is, uh, let's go back to voluntary. It's a forced social contract if that right is not retained. Uh, Because by denying the right to life, then nothing else matters. So um, it would be forced if uh, not a voluntary social contract. uh, The acquiescence is there, but the acquiescence is by intimidation or force. Is the social contract a form of peer pressure? I wouldn't call it peer pressure. I, I don't think that there's a, a pressure to comply with something that's clearly stated. And the, a proper co- social con- contract obviously should have, let's call them the rules, clearly stated. Uh, peer pressure, to me, tends to be more of a social relationship than a social contract, you know, keeping up with the Joneses or uh, say somebody's loud, boisterous, and you don't like it, so you, you shun him, you turn your back on him. It's not criminal, therefore it, doesn't, it shouldn't come in the realm of the social contract. So I would say no, it is not a form of peer pressure. Are property rights supported by the social contract? Well, again, as is in the uh, the right of self defense, uh, a a totally agreeable uh, social contract would allow me both life and property that I could grow my crops, that I could uh, uh, ha- have my land and build my home upon it, and raise my smallest social contract with family on it. But then let's go back to feudal or uh, a, a forced society. The forced society. The social contract imposes uh, upon the life and the property. The property is owned by the Lord, and the tenant farmer uh, has an obligation to give most of his pro- the product of his effort on the land that's owned by the Lord to the la- uh, uh, landlord, the the Lord himself. So, in that case, is is forced and. Uh, so I would say it's almost equatable. If I have the right to defend my life, I also have to have the right to defend my defend my property because if I don't have property, my life is lost. I have no way to grow food to feed my family. Therefore, I starve to death unless there are enough berries out in the woods for me to sustain the whole family. Speak, you, you spoke about forced societies. So... Does the social contract legitimize tyranny? Legitimize being making uh, legal uh, if the laws of that society uh, are tyrannical. Yes, it does. There, there's no doubt about that. Again, back to what happened in this country a little over 200 years ago. Uh, the effort to, to remove that t- uh, tyrannical or despotic uh, structure completely uh, was, was part of the written Constitution. The limitations of power and authority granted in the Constitution, uh, the, the rights retained by the states and the people, and the, the individual rights themselves that are addressed in the Constitution, all went to remove that tyrannical aspect. But it is not a, uh, a given that a social contract doesn't legitimize tyranny because when we look back at histor- historically at uh, social contracts, for the most part, to some degree, they did legitimize uh, tyranny. The feudal system of England, for example, uh, was tyrannical because it, depending on the Lord and his mood and what side of bed he got out of, he could treat you any way he wanted. That's definitely tyrannical. 
Some political dissidents make assumptions uh, about the social contract because of the second word contract. So, Gary, how is the social contract different from, say, a business contract? Well, I hate to admit that I studied law at, at two different points in my life, one business law early on, and later I was uh, uh, actually a pre-law student. But uh, I mentioned earlier there are two principal elements in a contract is a meeting of the minds and consideration for consideration. Now, the consideration, we will protect you from encroachments by the enemy, from attack by a foreign power, uh, is a consideration. But you, in the, uh, by the same token, have to be a, a, in whatever conditions are established in it. Uh, uh, an obedient citizen, you have to follow the rules. Uh, and it can even extend to, and you know, this is a whole different subject called taxation, because the taxation, the income tax now does not fall within the realm that was authorized by the Constitution in any way, shape, or form. But that, like I say, is a different program. So the consideration for the consideration is there. We'll protect you, but you be obedient, an obedient member of the society within the constraints of the contract. Now, is there a meeting of the minds? Now, this is where we get into the uh, rather interesting question. Um, a child's born. Obviously, his mind isn't matured enough to have a meeting of the minds with even his parents, let alone the society as a whole, the, the town, the county, the state, or the, the uh, uh, national society. Uh, as he grows and evolves, he begins to develop a uh, meeting of the minds with his parents. You, you uh, will milk the cows, you'll do this and you'll do that, and we'll feed you. That understanding, that meeting of the minds exists. Part of the reason that Jefferson and, and others and uh, believe that the necessity of education, uh, public education, not the form we have now, don't mistake what we have now with what was conceived by Jefferson, uh, was for people to understand their government and how it functions. And how that government functions was necessary then for people after they finished their education and stepped out in the world or uh, achieved the age of majority is what it was called back then, uh, where they could marry and, and, and move off into society itself. That education was necessary for that meeting of the minds. Now, we've been denied that meeting of the minds because the educational system being taken over first by the state and eventually by the federal government and them dictating out a true understanding of the principles of government and putting in their modified version. So the meeting of minds still exists in that case. Now, what happens when that meeting of the minds ceases to exist? Now we get back to Sons of Liberty 14 or the Declaration of Independence. So for those that uh, didn't get it last time, let's get the Sons of Liberty 14 up there again. Um, if the contract, the meeting of the minds is well understood with a written constitution, that's the beauty of what we have in the United States. If we recognize that that contact was breached and to an extent that we were no, that the government was no longer acceptable to the people, um, well, let's put it in uh, Jefferson's words in the Declaration, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. And he continues, Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But finally, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. That means take what you learned, rewrite the social contract, put better safeguards in, and let's go on from there. So that's the, 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 the concept and uh, of, of meeting of the minds. If the minds cease to meet, let's just say I buy chickens from you, and every month I want 10 chickens, and I'm willing to pay you 
$10 for those 10 chickens, and I'm getting good quality chickens. And all of a sudden, I, and even though it might not be written in the contract, all of a sudden I'm getting uh, diseased, uh, feeble chickens with no meat on them. They're just bones and uh, skin hanging on the bones. Is that a breach of contract? Well, I might tolerate it a while, but eventually if I can't remarket those chickens or I can't sustain my family with those chickens, whatever the purpose is, uh, do I get to a point that I consider it a breach of contract? Well, yes, and th then the mines shall no longer meet because whether uh, implicit or implied in the contract, the assumption was that the chickens would be edible or marketable, whichever my purpose was. And when they cease to meet that, the meetings of the mines ceases because the consideration is not equitable or equal to the consideration in return. And so back to the Constitution, or the British Constitution, or our Constitution. When the meeting of the minds gets to a point that the words are so misunderstood that what we think we're getting is not what we're getting or not what we believe we should be getting, that meeting of the minds ceases to exist. Now, it requires a continuing contract to make that meetings of minds and interpretations uh, down the road, because if I'm just buying 10 chickens from you for $10, that meeting of the minds is an instant. And once the, the, the contract is consummated, you've got your $10 and I've got the chickens. But it's a perpetual contract wherein we come into a, uh, a problem with the meetings, uh, meeting of the minds. So it's... Okay. It, it, it is a, a business contract in that respect, in that the conditions of a contract must be met. Okay, so similarly, how does the social contract differ from an employment contract? Well, an employment contract, there, there's not a whole lot of difference, really, but an employment contract tends to be uh, a temporary contract for a term, uh, in some cases, and others is, is just temporary. There are right-to-work states, and there are states that are not right-to-work. Uh, in a right-to-work state, the contract be, can be terminated by either party without notice. Uh, other states uh, where there is not the right to work, they tend to have a little more protective laws. Uh, so, but an, an employment contract is a short term and a small aspect of your life. It's conditioned use. Eight hours a day, it applies. The rest of the time, you're free. Where the social contract is 24 hours a day. And you're subject to it all the time. There is no exception. Perhaps if you leave the country, if the contract allows you to separate yourself from certain obligations, if you leave the country, it might be true. But I'm not aware of any in our contract. So one is perpetual and uh, all-encompassing, at least to the extent of the authority of the contract, and the other one's a, uh, a temporary relationship, and it's uh, applicable only during that period of time in which you're working or operating under that contract. Now, ha you spoke about taxation just a moment ago. Has the social contract been used to legitimize taxation? Well, it depends on the contract, and uh, I've done some research on the, the Constitution. This, this phrase, direct tax, has always bothered me, and so I went looking for answers for years, and fairly recently I found an interesting book called Ratification by Pauline Mayer. And she addresses that issue, not in her words, but by going back in history and pulling forward the terms of the contract as expressed verbally in four or five of the ratification conventions in the states. Now, it may have been done in more states. When we're looking back at history like this, what is available, what was recorded, and what, what is available uh, is perhaps limited. But in at least four or five instances, the Federalists, who were the promoters of the Constitution, said direct taxes will only be applied in emergencies. And then if we look in an historical context, we will find that direct taxes were not income taxes. They were on the land, a fixed commodity, on the land itself. 
and that they had to be apportioned among the, the states so that each state would, based on its representation, would have a limited share. Now, somehow we've gotten away from that. So we've got two things. The consideration has changed. All of a sudden they're saying, you owe me more than your obedience. You owe me half your paycheck. And we've also dissolved that meeting of the minds because it was understood for over a century the direct uh, taxes were only applied to land, and it was understood for over a century that direct taxes would only be collected in an emergency. Otherwise, uh, the taxes were on excise, imposts, and duties, generally commercial enterprise. In fact, uh, Hamilton, I think in Federalist Papers 12 or 14, pointed out that the primary source of revenue uh, she'll be commerce because commerce benefits more than anybody else uh, from the existence of the, the federal government for, because of trade treaties, because of the Navy protecting the, the merchant ships. Uh, and, and so the contract as it existed has been modified. And in this case, both the consideration for consideration has been re, redefined by one party. Now, a contract can change with the blessings of both parties, which is the Fifth Amendment in the Constitution requiring an amendment and giving a process for the amendment. So you, uh, we didn't go through that process to modify the terms of the contract. The government usurped authority beyond its authority and changed the consideration for consideration. At the same time, they had a significant check uh, effect on the whole concept of the meeting of the minds because these weren't the minds that came up with the original contract. There's been a deviation from, from that. So to justify compuls uh, or to legitimize tax, it would have to be within the uh, constraint of the Constitution. And if it's not within the constraints of the Constitution or the powers granted by the Constitution, and perhaps it's important to say here, the Supreme Court has recognized many times that Law is intent, regardless of the words, what, what's called the, uh, uh, if we find a record of what was intended when they said something, then that's the intent. And you can't change the intent of what was understood be, to be the reason and justification for this law later on to satisfy a different purpose. Those that voted for it understood it this way, and you can't later change it to that way. You can't make turkeys down into chickens, and you can't change the intent of the contract. So it can be used to legitimize con uh, taxation to the extent that it's authorized, not to the extent that they choose to make it. Does a social contract justify compulsory taxation? If that is within the constraints just discussed, yes, it is compulsory. It is part of your consideration for consideration to the extent that it's authorized by the contract. Once it exceeds that which is authorized by the contract, it is an illegal or an unlawful compulsion. If Okay, hold on a second. If that's the case, if so, then how would the social contract remain consistent with the principles of liberty? Long train of abuses. Uh, I think I answered that, and I think Sons of Liberty 14 will answer that. Uh, there's a point in time. There was in the colonies here. They'd been in, in place for 250 years, some of them. And all of a sudden, they realized that this contract is being violated, and they were sufficient in number. Initially, we're talking about maybe 3 4 5% of the people were upset over what was happening, and they got other people to go along with non-importation, various measures, trying to force back to compliance with the English Constitution. But eventually, those people got a larger and larger gathering, and finally said on July 4, 1776, says, you have breached the contract. It's the, beyond that point. Now, remember, from Lexington and Concord to uh, 
1770, uh, July 4th, 1776, we had a, um, an olive branch petition that went to the, the king and, and to the parliament. We had a number of measures, uh, petitions that were trying to redress these grievances, but there was no redress. There was no response in most cases, which is kind of what we get today. No response from government. They have no obligation to respond to our demands, our petitions. Um, and so it, it was cumulative and it got to, it got to the breaking point, the straw that broke the camel's back that they said this was enough. Now, prior to July 4th, there were those that were willing to fight until England agreed to sit down, the Parliament agreed to sit down at the table and discuss these things. But after July 4th, uh, that closed the door on reconciliation with England. It was done. It was out of the picture, no longer tenable, uh, because the breach had grown too wide and the animosity had grown to the point and enough lights were lost to the point that there was no um, recourse but to either uh, to follow through on the course the colonists have chosen uh, to win or lose. Lose would have put them under absolute submission. They would have been a penal colony at that point, much like Australia was, uh, to win, then allowed them to uh, take the lessons of history and to come up with a written constitution which intention has since been breached, uh, but uh, for the first time in history, laid out on paper what they felt would be a lasting government, the great experiment. Does remaining in the country prove individual consent to the social contract? Well, I think that they all remained in the country. You know, we're we're in a different world now. They could go to Philadelphia, um, and they, you know, after about a year, they could go back to Boston and remain in the country. A little tougher nowadays with helicopters and uh, radio tracking devices and things like that. Uh, but there's two ways to deal with it. One is you recognize the breach and you say we want to replace this government in accordance with the Declaration of Independence, and the other one is to flee the country. And when you do that, you give up any protections afforded by the country, uh, and you go establish yourself elsewhere. Those are two valid options. Um, but as long as you stay in the country, the government is going to assume your consent until that withdrawal of consent becomes open and notorious. And at that point, you will probably, well, <laughs> become an enemy of the state. Now, looking at the current circumstances in this country, it seems that they're predefining enemy of the state by uh, the MCIC and the uh, 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 FEMA publications talking about people that believe in the Bible, the Constitution, and military veterans, they've already made, in a sense, enemies of the state. And if you're an enemy of the state, why not take on the state? But, you know, that is the individual choice. Now, there was something recognized back then. It was called a state of nature. And that's where there is no government. There is no social contract on a larger scale. You might still be part of the family. You could be part of the community. In fact, Worcester, Massachusetts, the county of Worcester, Massachusetts in 1774, resorted to a state of nature uh, because of the uh, Massachusetts Government Act. They said, screw you. They went to the courthouse, told all the judges to resign or else. The judges resigned. They abandoned the charter, the new charter, and told the Crown that unless they reverted to the original charter, which wasn't modified by the Massachusetts Government Act, uh, that they had declared independence from England. So they actually declared it, I think it was in May of 1774, but uh, they removed the contract, and they were in a state of nature. Now, in that state of nature, then they immediately turned around and reinstituted a judicial system with new appointments and uh, dealing with justice, and it was done without any Tory participation. A lot of the previous judges had been Tories, and a lot of the influential people were Tories. They also disbanded the militia. 
and then they re-enrolled the militia and re-enrolled the constitution uh, the uh, commissioned uh, recommissioned officers but they allowed no Tories to join the militia or become officers in the militia. So for an instant in time, they were in an absolute state of nature. And then as a, a county in western Massachusetts, that county existed in a state of nature with respect to uh, England and perhaps the western rest of Massachusetts, even though they had good relations with the rest of Massachusetts trade and commerce between the various counties uh, continued. And uh, another one that might be considered to have resorted to a state of nature would be Vermont, because it was the uh, the missing child, that uh, a long-lost child, I forgot how Washington referred to it when Vermont became a state, but they were shunned by both sides. They were no longer British. And New York and New Hampshire fighting over them, they refused to acquiesce to either one. So Vermont for a while, until it, uh, it joined the Union and ratified the Constitution as the 14th colony, uh, was actually in a state of nature. So that condition of a state of nature is one where your mind and your, your being recognizes the fact that I am out of contract with the government. And so I live here, uh, do what I have to to, to try and avoid brutal attacks against me, but I recognize that my relationship with the uh, United States government uh, has ceased to exist. And so I am in a state of nature in that respect. And on that note, we are going to go to a brief break for uh, just a moment or so, folks. So sit back, lie back, grab a cup of coffee, do what you need to do, and we will return momentarily. Good Talk Radio takes a lot of effort to make it successful. It is truly a labor of love to bring high-quality episodes of OPF Radio to your digital music player. However, we do need to meet our operating expenses. We are completely independent media who are entirely supported by our listeners. So we are not beholden to either corporate special interests or unscrupulous advertisers who would use us to push their products. If you believe in our mission to bring original and useful material to the Patriot community, please consider making a donation today. Thank you so much for making this outreach effort worthwhile for all of us. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, for this OPF episode on the social contract. We are taking questions from the audience at this time. The call-in number is area code 530-576-5790. Area code 530-576-5790. Alternatively, you can add Skype user OPF Radio as a contact if you happen to have Skype. Or you can simply ask a question in the listener chat room, and I'll mention it for you on the air as your voice. And while we wait for those lovely questions and calls, Gary, is the social contract geographic, unilateral, and implicit? There have been a couple questions posed uh, through Circuitous Channels, and I think we need to address them. Uh, okay. Uh, what room is there for dissent in a social contract that becomes a governmental contract? Three people refused to sign the last day of the Federal Convention of 1787. If five of the 13 ratifying states, the percent of voting dissidents was over 40 percent, what obligation to the social contract if a person dissents? Um, within any society, uh, there, there, let's go back. In a paternal society or maternal society, the, the father or the mother is, is God. In a dictatorial society or monarchy, the dictator or the king is God. Uh, in a voluntary society such as ours, it's based on a, a concept, and, and, and it's the only viable one, of majority. However, back in 1787, uh, well, we're, you're talking about 1787. It doesn't matter whether people signed in 1787 or not. That document, that piece of paper, that idea, that concept that came out of the convention in Philadelphia went first 
to the Congress that had been formed under the Articles of Confederation. That Congress then, without comment, forwarded, forwarded that do, uh, document onto the 13 colonies, all 13. Those colonies were given a choice of whether they wanted to ratify it or not. Now, the Constitution specifically says the ratification, this is Article 7, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. So it would not go into effect unless approximately three quarters, well, I guess it would be two-thirds, three-quarters, whatever it was, ratified it, there was no government. If they, There was no coercion to bring these other colonies in. But these other colonies, regardless of the, if it was 50.1%, by a majority, they opted into the Constitution and ratified it, and as such, as a society in that state, became members of this larger contract. So there was no coercion there. Uh, the, they, they had a cho choice. Two states refused to, uh, there was a Bill of Rights. One, once the Bill of Rights was submitted, joined, and then Rhode Island uh, did not until there was a, a, a Bill of Rights was ratified. They ratified the Constitution at the same time as the Bill of Rights. Uh, so we can't look at 1787. We have to look at 1789 where the ratification in accordance with the Constitution, and nobody was a player unless they joined the game, by a majority in each of the nine states ratified it, and subsequently the other states, uh, the other four states, um, ratified it as well. Now the next question, if the Fifth Amendment says that you cannot be made to testify against yourself, what right does the government have to demand an answer as to whether you agree or disagree with the social contract? Well, I don't know that that would be testifying to make a statement, and I don't know that the government's asking me if I could get, di agree or disagree with the social contract. However, when we discuss that, we begin crossing a jurisdictional line that is not a part of the issue of social contract uh, tonight. So that question, um, the government has never asked me if I agree or disagree with the social contract. Now, that does lead to another question. I'm born, and I grow up. And, well, Sleepy, do we have that subject down further in our questions? I believe so. Okay, so we'll just continue, as, unless there's anything else outstanding. Uh, let's go back Okay, so is the so, and this is something that's been kind of coming up from uh, a lot of different types of political dissonance, so it needs to be addressed. Gary, is the social contract geographic, unilateral, and implicit? Is it geographic? It it tends to be, though it can go beyond geographic boundaries. For uh, for example, the United States affords protection to. Uh, U.S. flag merchant ships, uh, citizens in other countries, um, uh, and <laughs> your father protects you when you go down the street. So from both ends of the spectrum, now some, the temporary ones, the church and the uh, school might not necessarily extend beyond that point. Uh, the town is, is definitely geographic because they're not going to protect you once you leave the town. County, likewise, they're not going to protect you. State, likewise, they're not going to protect you except to the extent uh, provided for in the Constitution where you be treated the same as citizens of a state if you're visiting that state. Now, as far as unilateral, I'm not quite sure what you mean, so perhaps you, it, and the implicit. I mean, well, we can deal with the implicit. It's implicit if, uh, if it's written in the Constitution. Um, if it's not, then it, it, it's not. And unless it come, comes within the scope, that authority doesn't exist. So the Ninth and Tenth Amendment were written in the Bill of Rights to fill that hiatus, that void between these elements. It said if they're not addressed, they belong to states and or the people. So uh, there are no voids in the contract because of that. Now, wait, wait, we're living today, aren't we? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that now. 
Now, as far as unilateral, explain what these people, the, the source of this question meant by unilateral. Sure. What they meant by unilateral was that the social contract is uh, imposed upon from the state, you know, the polity, government, to the citizen in one direction. And, you know, in, put, it, put it another way, the citizen cannot impose the social contract on the government, but the government can. So the question being, is the social contract, is it true that it is unilateral as well? What did they do in 1775 and 1776? Didn't they impose the contract on government? Um, acquiescence accepts the condition. If there's a breach and you acquiesce to the breach, you accept acquiescence. Um, do you have the right? Why do you think the Second Amendment is there? If we need to turn this government over, the Second Amendment was without a doubt. Read the words of the founders. Was there, should that government exceed its authority and become despotic or tyrannical? So... The, 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 the problem, I guess the gray area comes in. I'm born. Uh, well, obviously, I'm subject to the contract because I can't fight back. As I grow up, if I get that education Jefferson talked about, I understand government. And if they breach their contract, I'm more likely to object when they breach it. But if I'm taught by the government schools that uh, the government is omnipotent and can do anything at once, then I accept and acquiesce that condition. At some point, however, when I think that the strain is too great in my relationship with government, I have to, for, by whatever means available to me, um, assume myself in a state of nature. And when, I can, when enough people can come together that find themselves in this, that same condition as happened from 1765 to 1775, they will be, gather their forces. Now... Hidden history. Uh, during 1774, a year before Lexington Concord, there were instances where tens of thousands of people with staves or pitchforks or, or, or uh, rifles went to courthouses and told the judges to resign. And it was basically, it was over foreclosures. Ironically, it was over foreclosures because there wasn't enough money circulating in the the colonies, because the taxes were eating up the specie, the silver and gold coin, and most states had to issue paper currency like uh, Federal Reserve notes, and this is all people had. Now, if the person I owed a, a, on the note to wanted specie and I had paper, and he said, not that not acceptable, which is why the provision all debt uh, gold and silver in the Constitution, uh, then he could foreclose on me because I didn't have specie, silver or gold, to pay any obligation to him. So the people got outraged, and that was one of the elements that through western Massachusetts, where there was no money. Now, remember, Boston had been embargoed. They had the Massachusetts Government Act, the Massachusetts Port Act, and these people were in dire straits, and they had no recourse. So they were forced into that state of nature. And worse is the one that I, I found the best example on. But uh, you can impose back on government when there is a sufficient force to do it. Individually, you can try. There are a lot of people that try legal remedies, but trouble is they're using the rules of government to try these legal remedies. And I don't know if that can be achieved or not. I have yet to see people successfully uh, achieve uh, fighting back through the courts that are run by the government. Do now a theme I keep seeing is about um, people thinking that you know if they don't sign the social contract it's somehow illegitimate. So I guess the pro best way to probably phrase the question, Gary, is: Do social contracts need to be signed individually? If not, does the social contract only require tacit consent or even just acquiescence in order to be valid? Well, I don't know anybody that really gave tacit consent until, say, they went into the military and took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. But everybody that's taken that oath has taken an oath, so there's tacit. Um, acquiescence, we've talked about already. When you're born and until you reach that age of majority, you basically acquiesce to the society. Now, it's been proposed that it doesn't apply to me because I didn't sign the contract. And here we get into... I don't think it's something that I don't think is the least bit confusing. 
And the people that I've discussed with over the years that have taken, let's say, the, the Spooner position, that's not a sexual term, that's Lysander Spooner, uh, have said that I didn't sign the contract, therefore it does, is not binding on me. Well, the contract, the, the Constitution doesn't really bind you if you read it very carefully. It, it, the laws that are allowed are counterfeiting, uh, violation of copyright, uh, treason, piracy, there's only about six or seven authorities, and then if you look at the first couple decades of the country, all the way to the Civil War, you'll find that the government only imposed criminal acts on land that was ceded to the federal government and had jurisdiction ceded as well. So they didn't reach out and touch our lives. But that aside, uh, the question arises, I didn't sign the contract. Well, there's 300 million people in this country today. Let's assume they're all lawful, just for the sake of discussion. Well, how many have there been since uh, those 3 million stood against uh, the British colonies back in 1776? There were about 3 million then. So we probably got easily a billion people that have lived in this country as citizens during that uh, uh, 220, 230 years. So... I'm trying to think now, how big a piece of paper would I need to get everybody to sign it? Now, before computers, obviously, if I was to sign it, I would have to have a piece of paper to sign it on. So when we had 3 million people then, did we need 3 million people? Did we ask 3 million people to sign it? Or did we accept the concept of majority under a democracy uh, and don't go challenging the word democracy. I use it loosely, okay? Uh, we accept that concept of majority because it would be impractical back then, and with the cost of paper, it would have been prohibitive uh, economically, uh, perhaps, to provide enough paper for three million people to sign it. Now, if you can get in two columns, perhaps 40 to 50 signatures, let's say 50 signatures on a, a piece of eight and a half by 11 paper, do some quick math. How many sheets of paper? do you need to get 3 million signatures? How many would you need to get 300 million uh, signatures? Well, let's look at another aspect that makes this, let's say, ludicrous. Um, at what point do you sign? At birth? At one year of age? At the age of majority, which varied from colony to colony, but generally ran from 12 to 18 years of age. What point in your life now do you have to sign or reject this contract? Well, let's say 18, age of majority, and presume you're educated and can make a rational decision. So every year or every month, those that turned 18 this year or this month go down to sign the contract. Now, with 300 million people, I'm not sure how many that is, but that's a heck of a lot of people. And uh, I guess it would be kind of like signing up for the draft. Now, what happens if somebody doesn't sign that? Does that mean that they can live in this society and the benefits of this society and drive on the roads that are created by the society and have the protections afforded by the military against foreign invasion by the society and all these other things? But since they didn't sign, they don't have to pay taxes? What do you do with the people that refuse to sign? Isn't there an impracticality to the whole concept of saying, I didn't sign, therefore I'm not bound by? The solution is quite simple. The solution is addressed in the Declaration of Independence and in that article, Sons of Liberty 14. There is a simple solution. There is a complex solution. No, it's not a solution. There's a complex and unanswered proposal uh, proffered by Lysander Spooner and these people that uh, persist in, in bringing forward Lysander uh, Spooner's agreement. Now, I, I'm going to be honest. I've never read the entirety of, I think it's Constitution of No Consequence, and it was part of a series that he wrote. I've never read the entirety because I get laughing somewhere along the line. But in all that I have read, he is pointing out a problem, and that's easy to do. We've got a problem. He's offered no solution. He's offered nothing to accommodate dealing with the problem that he's proposing. Now, what good is that? we got a problem. What's the solution? I don't know. I guess we'll continue to have a problem, or we will accept the, con uh, the, the fact that uh, we acquiesce until 
we determine that we're in a state of nature because of breach of contract. Now, and we're to look at it. And following that theme with uh, Lysander Spooner, we do have a question from the chat room by Even Hand. Here's a question for y'all from Lysander. If the Constitution is binding on those who created it and agree with it, what right is there to bind future generations to that social contract? Well, uh, okay, we run into the same problem. D Jefferson worked out once regarding debt and the ability to tax into the future, and I think he came up with 18.3 years of age as the average generation uh, by his figuring. So does that mean we throw the Constitution on the auction block, or do we rewrite it at 18.3 years? Because there has to be a point. You can't do it annually. Nobody would be able to raise crops. Everybody would be busy dealing with this Constitution. So let's use, in fact, let's round it off. Let's use 20 years. Every 20 years, we're going to throw the Constitution out for reconsideration. Well, I guess we could do that. Now, do we... Uh, Understand that ratification means accept as is. It doesn't, the amendment process allows revision, but to ratify is as is. So do we just toss it out and say, okay, here's a blank sheet of paper, start over? Do we put this out for ratification, i.e. acceptance as is? Or perhaps we could resort to what's called the Fifth Amendment and say, we want to amend the Constitution because we think there's something bad there. But now let's say we're at 18.3 years uh, of age, and those that are 18 years old uh, up to 36 are those that are allowed to vote. Now, these aren't the wisest people in the country by a long shot. In fact, my father years ago suggested you begin acquiring wisdom somewhere around 40 years of age. So we've got people for, uh, for all intents and purposes have not reached that uh, – social level of maturity and, and wisdom, and they're going to rewrite the Constitution? Now, if they rewrite the Constitution, is it binding on me because I accepted the one before it and I don't like this new one, but I'm too damn old to vote? Do you understand the, 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 the manifest uh, destructiveness of even trying to... Uh, come up with a solution to deal with re-ratification or adding my blessings to. But let's go back. Those that were in the military, I swear to uphold and defend the Constitution for the United States of America. That is an acquiescence. And it's uh, contracts can be written or verbal, or they can be implied. And uh, that, that's a verbal contract. That's beyond implied. Written is the strongest. Verbal is the uh, second strongest. Implied is the third. Uh, and I think there are other levels of contract w in that. So we've got second level for everybody that's gone into the military. If he didn't want to go with the Constitution and he was old enough to go in the military, he should have said, no, I ain't going to go because I don't like your contract. So acquiescence, uh, uh, verbal uh, agreement to, uh, implied agreement to, all these things come into play. So at this point, who's breaching the contract? So back to Lysander Spooner. He did not give us a solution, and I've been waiting for a long time to, for somebody to come up with a, a plan, a, a viable idea on how to address this ludicrous concept that we could re-ratify or uh, I'm not bound by the contract or anything else. You have lived under it. For 18 years. You've accepted it for 18 years. That's acquiescence. Now, if you don't acquiesce to it, are you going to write a new one, ratify the old one, or amend the old one? Only one of those makes any sense at all. And that provision was put in there by the founders for that very reason. You cannot go back and redress the past. Now, many states, almost every state has rewritten their constitution, and I disagree with that concept vehemently because they kind of slide by the people and put stuff in there that shouldn't be there and, and take out stuff that should be there. But the national constitution, the United States Constitution, is the one we're addressing right now. And so give me a solution. Don't give me a problem because I can't find a solution to that problem. 
If you have a solution to that problem, I'd love to hear it. More than anything, I've been looking for it for a long, long time. Just to remind the audience, we are taking questions from all of you at this time. The call-in number again is area code 530-576-5790. Again, area code 530-576-5790. Alternatively, if you have Skype, you can just add user OPF radio as a contact or you can simply ask a question in the listener chat room. Now, to move on, Gary, no, is wait, this so see something in the chat room that uh, it says, if 12 agreed and one disagreed, now that's 13, so I'm assuming they're talking about ratification of the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution says the one that did not ratify would still get included. No, it, it didn't. Uh, Rhode Island was not a part of the United States until it ratified the Constitution. There was nothing that compelled Rhode Island or later Vermont to enter the Union. It was until they ratified. Otherwise, they were a nation on their own in the world, and they would have to defend themselves unless they had a treaty or some compact with the United States. But I doubt the United States would have afforded that contract without their participation in um, providing a means to provide for the common defense and the general welfare and the blessings of liberty. So, no, that's a misstatement to say if one disagreed, the Constitution said that one that did not ratify would still get included. It was not. It was excluded. Go back and read some history. They were not a member. They were still part of the uh, Articles of Confederation contract uh, uh, Congress, which was totally ineffective at that time. I think they kind of pretty much packed their bags and went home, even though on paper they still existed under the Articles of Confederation, but they were ineffective because the other 12 had abandoned it. And that left what, uh, and I think Rhode Island was the last one to ratify the, uh, of the 13. Uh, Rhode Island was basically on its own. It was independent in the world. It had declared independence from England and had not rejoined the United States. So, uh, okay, Sleepy, back to you. Is the social contract intended to be the highest moral good? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that morality, now, our, our, moral, our, our, our social contract recognizes what might be called uh, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, ethics or Judeo-Christian morality. Uh, the morality is not inherent in it, though it's implied in it. Uh, we're not a Christian, otherwise we'd be a uh, uh, theocracy. Um, but the, 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 the moral aspects of it is not addressed in the Constitution. In fact, the states back then, for the most part, adopted... The common law of England is, is, existed July 4, 1776, the date of separation. Uh, common law, for all intents and purposes, not statutory or Roman civil law or however we want to define it, basically is one that protects us uh, between um, f from being injured by other parties. So there's not really a moral equivalent to it. There is a degree of morality because... Um, you know, states that don't believe in thievery will cut off the hands of the thief, and I think the moral values that were implied on ours weren't uh, to the moral good, but they were to that moral standard where there are other forms of punishment, and back then, that punishment tended to be restitution and perhaps uh, fines, uh, uh, penalties, uh, for, as a consequence of the... Uh, to discourage future behavior that was uh, offensive against another person. But the moral good, the uh, highest moral good, what is the highest moral good? It depends on your if you're a Buddhist, a uh, Hindu, uh, a Muslim, a Christian, an atheist. They all have different moral goods. So I think that's why the, the founder chose not to incorporate uh, a specific god in the Constitution, by virtue of uh, understanding that the Christian Judeo 
values were the moral foundation, which is why the Ten Commandments was all over the Supreme Court building, but it wasn't codified in law because of the problem it had between the various religions that preceded the Constitution formation of the United States. Each had its different set of standards. Some could burn witches at the stake, and others, uh, the Quakers, were much more gentle. Uh, there was no standard, but basically the moral values were very similar, and they were due unto you, others that you would have them do unto you. Is the social contract logically consistent? I'm not sure what logically consistent means, but I would think that the Constitution, as written, as, as intended by the, the founders, is logically consistent. However, there were a lot of omissions in it that had to be addressed over time. Um, they were sitting with a, a, a clean sheet of paper, and they couldn't anticipate uh, all the problems w w that would arise. Now, as far as the judiciary, they judiciary, but then they put it upon Congress to go beyond the Supreme Court to establish any uh, courts other than the United States Supreme Court. And so uh, they didn't go into detail on the judicial structure, but they accommodated it. So logically, they uh, made provision for that, but there are other areas. Did they go into detail on on taxes. Well, the idea of income tax and people having to keep track of what they made when they sold their chickens was beyond comprehension to them, so they didn't go into details in a lot of these other areas. And so you could say it's logically inconsistent, but then if we look at the times then, we I would say that it was logically consistent uh, to the extent that they could perceive, see into the future, and identify the problems that might arise and try and address them. Can a social contract exist without government? Now, uh, I hate to sound like Clinton, it depends on how you define government, because let's go back to the family. There is a government there. Uh, Dad is the president, mom's the vice president, the oldest brother is the, the, the <laughs> sergeant at arms. Um, for all intents and purposes, when there's a, a, a body politic of any size, a family onto a nation, and unfortunately with the United Nations, even unto the world, uh, there is a form of government established. The extent of that government, now here we get into an interesting area. In many Supreme Court decisions, it basically says, this is before the Civil War and the 14th Amendment, basically says that the states are responsible for what happens in the states, and our laws, the federal laws, don't apply there. That's your jurisdiction. You have an executive, legislative, and judicial. In fact, there was a case called Barron versus State uh, in 1803, I think. And it was an interesting case in that uh, Barron owned a wharf along the river in Baltimore. And he made, his business was bringing ships in, offloading supplies, storing them in the warehouses, and getting fees for all of this. Now, then the city of Baltimore comes along and dredges the canal, and when they did, did so, they deprived him of access to ships that were coming in before. So he went to the Supreme Court of the United States uh, and said, they're denying me... Uh, uh, property without due process of law. And the Supreme Court says the Constitution applies to the federal government only. It does not apply to the states. The reason there are state governments is those people within those states uh, have every right to establish laws that are uh, or a Constitution that's consistent with the majority of the people in that state. The reason for the federal Constitution is the overwhelming concern by the framers, and the reason of the weakness of the Articles of Confederation, that the states would lose their autonomy and that they would be subject to federal rule. So until the Civil War, the federal government stayed out of state uh, matters. The state constitution did not afford protection to private property. The federal government could not intervene. However, the federal government could not come in and deny somebody their property without due process. It had no effect on the states. It wasn't until after the 14th and subsequently that the Supreme Court 
began changing this contract to be more accommodating to the federal government, less accommodating to the state, and less accommodating to the people themselves. Now, you might say it's more accommodating to the people because now we're under this one national government, but I don't believe that. I don't want federal protection within the state that I live in. I want state protection under this state. I want the autonomy of states. I want the state's rights to the extent that they're authorized specifically and is intended by the Constitution. Now, from the listener chat room, Anonymous asks a two-part question. So if a group of people who had a specific agenda took their rifles to the courthouse and demanded that a judge who was put in place by an opposing group resign, where would that leave the other group? Would that set up a violent confrontation between groups? with opposing agendas on certain issues? Well, your question is directed at a specific judge. Um, what happened in, in Western Massachusetts was not, and this, you know, the, the, the kicking out, the, the resignation of judges went all, all through Western Massachusetts. It did not go in Essex County, I think it's Essex, that Boston says that almost every other county went through these uh, motions. But they didn't kick out one judge. They kicked out the judges that were put in under the uh, uh, Massachusetts Government Act. So you can't focus on one judge and say, this guy's corrupt. There is a solution, and it's called part one of the plan. Uh, if that judge, in fact, I wrote an article at Waco about something about a, a, a vial of volatile, volatile liquid uh, exploding under a, the guy's carriage. Uh, it's called assassination. If the government I wrote another article about the Constitution, the powers that, that we gave the government, we had. We gave them to the government. I didn't know it at the time, but apparently we gave them the right to assassinate people because they've assumed that we have given them to assassinate people. Now, if we gave them right to assassinate people, then we must have had that right to give them. And when I read the Constitution, it does not say that I no longer have the right to assassinate people. Now, if you understand that concept, the government has told us we have the right to assassinate because we gave it to the government, and they did not specifically deny us the right to assassinate, then we still retain that right. And if that's the case, if it's a single judge, there's a logical conclusion, a logical solution. Now, if you want to get rid of the government, that's what they were doing in Massachusetts. So all judges, good guys, bad guys, doesn't matter. We're getting rid of the Massachusetts government and instituting the Worcester County government. That's there is apples and oranges, but I believe there's a constitutional remedy. And uh, I think my article is, let's talk about the Constitution. Um, that addresses that concept that the Constitution, we can only give the government that which we have. Uh, therefore, uh, the government cannot have anything we did not give it, if that's the case. Um, they have told us that they have the right to uh, assassinate people, then we must assume that they got that right from us, and they have not denied us that right, therefore that we still retain that right. Now, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's getting to the point that uh, you are saying there's a breach of contract. Um, that's an individual choice. What can I say? Well, speaking about assassinations, is the social contract immoral? <laughs> I don't think the constitutions are immoral. But like I told you, I live in a state of nature. I only relate to the government to the extent that's absolutely necessary uh, to provide for my safety. Uh, say a, uh, a mountain man goes out and, and gets along with the Indians. He doesn't have to be part of the tribe, but he gets along with the Indians to the point that they're not going to attack him and kill him and scalp him. And so I, that's where I live with the government. Uh, is it immoral now? you damn right it is, because the Constitution says that the only Congress can declare war, 
And since 1953, whenever it was, we have gone into what's called police actions. Now, Jefferson did it. Um, well, Jefferson did the, the, the Barbary Coast, went in and dealt with the problem and got back out. It wasn't a perpetual war. The K Korean War has been going on for 60 years. Oh, the great Korean police action, 60 years. Uh, the longest war in our history, active war, is Afghanistan right now. It exceeds all the other wars we've been in in, in the length of the active combat in the war. Uh, but that's not a war either because Congress didn't declare these. So the immorality is there. The breach of the contract, that, that provision was put in the Constitution so that no one man would have the power to go to war because he would only go to war to serve himself for gain, for whatever reasons he might do it. So the representative body, the people, the House of Representatives and the Senate, Congress, only Congress can declare war. That means that we had to, through our representatives, by back to that majority rule, say that, yes, we're justified in going to war. So when that authority was aspect of government became immoral. Whatever the justification was, it became immoral by breaching that constitution and going out, and let's be blunt about it, murdering people for whatever they chose to, uh, in they chose to pursue as a consequence of their police action. Does the social contract create a condition of slavery? It could, but in the case of the United States, it was only preservation of slavery. It did not create it. It preserved it for a limited period of time. I don't recall what it was, but they couldn't do any anything for a certain period of time. And after that period of time, they outlawed the importation of slavery. And a few decades later, they did away with slavery. But, you know, a social contract isn't necessarily the United States. And I'm sure that many countries have social contracts that allow slavery to be created by one means or another, capture, enemy, uh, uh, punishment for crime, perpetual slavery, uh, purchase. So they can create slavery by that act. Now, if the question is directed along the lines of taxes, uh, don't look at the slavery aspect. It, it looked like at the constitutionality, the constitutionality of it. Is it constitutional? Does it create tr 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 slavery by acquiescence or by involuntary action or by implied consent? Yes, it does. Now, that may sound strange, but let's make something clear. In 1984, I last paid income tax. I had my own business at the time. Since then, I've worked for seven or eight different companies, uh, corporations. Uh, I think all of them are probably corporations. But I have not paid income tax since then uh, because I don't recognize tax is valid under the Constitution. So are we creating slavery by virtue of income tax by paying income tax? Yes, but it's implied or is acquiesced to. It's implied. If you look at the 1040 next time you sign one, read it says a couple of things, but the significant one is down at the bottom, says, under penalty of perjury, I hereby certify that I am the taxpayer named above, and this information is true and correct. Something to that effect. So you have made yourself a taxpayer by that statement, under penalty of perjury. Now, taxpayer comes under the Title 26 of the U.S. Code. And so you have volunteered into that organization by saying, under penalty of perjury, I am the taxpayer named above. Now, if you're not a taxpayer, you don't have to pay taxes. So the IRS, the taxpayer, they have a choice. Take the money and run or charge you with perjury for lying on your, your W-4. So the slavery that is generally spoken of in this country is that of taxation. And I say it's a voluntary act and those people that choose to pay it. 
Now, there are, are a lot of ramifications to that, and we have scheduled another program down the road to go into taxes, to go into no de- more detail about what those ramifications are. But no, the con- social contract did not create slavery. It was the voluntary act of the people that chose to give the federal government their money. Now, Gary, here's probably the $64,000 question. What if someone wanted to replace one social contract with his own social contract? Is he at liberty to do this or not? Well, he says one social contract, so I'm not sure which social contract he's replacing with his own social contract. Well, his own social contract is valid to the extent that there are other parties to that contract in that social sphere that acquiesce to that contract. So, uh, well, let's look at it this way. My daughters don't have social security numbers. They don't have birth certificates. But they're part of my social contract. They're my daughters. When they leave the home, they leave that social contract. Are they bound? I didn't replace the other one, but I didn't introduce them into it, and I'm going to leave that choice to them when the time comes. But my social contract is this family, and as long as they remain in this house, they are bound to that social contract. Uh, I didn't replace another one, and I don't have the authority to replace the other one. I do have the authority as an individual to enter the state of nature where I reject the other one. So replacing is one thing, because to replace, you'd have to acknowledge the existence of the validity because it ceases to exist. It does not exist. So, the, you know, by the wording of the question, uh, i, I got to say absolutely not. You can't not replace it. And I would have to know what his own social contract was and who it extended to. If he thought that he could uh, replace the Constitution because he wrote one, that would be true if he could get enough people to step in that state of nature and go through the process that those people did 230 years ago to achieve a replacement, dissolve the existing government, and replace it with a new one. So, you know, depending on how I interpret what this uh, says, the answer is no, emphatically, or yes, emphatically. Well, Gary, the reason I ask is that I don't see any reason why some vloggers, especially those up on YouTube, seem to suggest a dichotomy between the non-aggression principle and the social contract, especially considering that Aaron Hawkins, who is a voluntarist, has admitted recently that the non-aggression principle is just a type of social contract. So I think it's a false dichotomy. Uh, also, but, but, but even if you were to say that that dichotomy was legitimately genuine, I'm just seeing different types of political dissonance trying to replace the social contract that's connected with the federal constitution with their own social contract, whether it's the non-aggression principle or something else. Well, if we look at the common law of England, an injured party, the jury determined whether a party was injured or not. You know, it was submitted to the jury. The jury heard evidence on both sides and made a determination. That is within the community. So it's the standard of the community. What I might get a guilty verdict in this community, I might not over there. And a good for instance, a um, horse thief in the West was capital crime, usually without trial. But in Massachusetts, you were probably returned the horse and perhaps paid a fine. So, uh, because your life could be at stake in the West, but in Massachusetts, it was simply an inconvenience. So, different jurisdictions, different towns, different counties, different states might have different standards on what constitutes a crime against another party. But it's based upon an injured party, and it's based upon a determination by a jury whether the party was sufficiently injured, and if so, what are the consequences to the party that did the injuring. Uh, When we get to what's called malo prohibita, which is laws, Roman civil law is the best way to define it, because uh, historically that is probably the most pronounced of a a structured legal system that said, you can, thou shall 
be able to do this, thou shalt not be able to do that. And um, those laws were, were strictly to force uh, social compliance without regard to moral values on people and to standardize justice, which doesn't require a jury, if you think about it, if you did this and it's proven. Uh, so, mala prohibita um, should not be a part of the social contract. And I don't think it was intended to be initially, as I go back and look at the laws. As I pointed out, the federal government passed laws with criminal penalties for destroying government property, one specifically in 1825, where they specifically said destroys government property on lands ceded to the federal government and where jurisdiction was ceded. Otherwise, that jurisdiction remains with the state. Not that we see this anymore, but that was how limited the authority was, and that was causing an injury to the United States government by damaging their property. And to uh, codify it, they had to be specific on the intent on what it applied to. Uh, now we've got laws that say you can't do this, can't do that. We can't even understand the laws. Uh, so... The the, uh, the limitation of the law is not recognized by the Constitution now. That's one of the major breaches of the contract. Okay, well, Gary, uh, any final thoughts or statements to posterity regarding social contracts? Well, there's uh, another link I've got in there. It's called the Tahoe Regional Area Plan, and this is kind of interesting. A lady named Maureen Heaton, she died, uh, I think, in 2000. Uh, but I used to, to correspond with her and speak with her on the phone uh, extensively, and she wrote some interesting articles. But we hear all this talk about Agenda 21, and we've got to get our, our uh, link man awake. Uh, but uh, Agenda 21 was first noticed in, in 1992. Uh, I published this article of hers in 1993 in February. And it was the first application of a government without a constituency and without jurisdictional boundaries. Tahoe Regional Area Plan was an appointed government, appointed by the state, not the people, but the state of Nevada and the state of California. They had created a government, governmental entity that incorporated parts of both two states in the Lake Tahoe uh, region. Ironically... <laughs> Their acronym is TRAP. Now, they later, I understand, changed their name to Tahoe Area Regional Plan because TRAP was rather suggestive, and that's exactly what it was. is pro perhaps the first non-elected government in, in this country that covered a, bro a broad area. Now, that's a breach of contract of Constitution, California Constitution, Nevada, and Constitution of the United States, really, because... Uh, states aren't supposed to enter contracts without the consent of Congress, and I don't know that Congress consented to this. However, uh, with that last uh, thought in there, and I think it's important that people realize how long this Agenda 21 policy has been going on, uh, I don't know that there's much left to say unless somebody has any more questions. Well, I'd like to thank you, Gary, for coming, up, uh, coming on tonight, and clearing up some misconceptions and straightening out what social contracts really are really are all about. I appreciate it. Well, I hope I cleared it up rather than created confusion, but uh, yes, I, I was nice to have the opportunity to uh, answer something that's been uh, close to my heart for years because this idea of Lysander Spooner's in my life goes back into the 80s, first working with the... Uh, uh, tax people, not the government ones, the other ones. And uh, so it's nice to hear my thoughts on it. And it, it's it's over 20 years that, that I've been contemplating this, studying history, trying to understand and grasp some concepts that Lysander Spooner uh, addressed in that. And, and quite frankly, I can't even get a finger hold, let a, a toe hold or anything on uh, what he poses is a problem without a solution, and I can't understand why he would have done that and, unless he just wanted to confuse people's minds. But uh, 
anyway, having no more questions, that's all I have to say. All right. Well, thank you again, Gary. Appreciate it. Well, everyone, that concludes this broadcast of Outpost of Freedom Radio. Please join us for our next episode on Monday, March 4th, where we will address the theme of If We Do This, Will They Do That? by taking a look at at motivational incentives and just a little bit of guerrilla warfare theory. Good night and good luck. I had a dream the other night that, well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press, and you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You've taken Satan's number. You've traded in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children won't be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you'll fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? Oh, sons of the Republic, arise, take a stand. Defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Preserve our great republic and each God-given right. And pray to God to keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he'd vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he'd fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free?